You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. After the Second World War, as college enrollment soared, presidents became more externally oriented and convinced or were convinced by trustees to adopt a corporate model of governance. This led to increased use of the term provost for the person who was the chief academic officer and usually, but not always, the second ranking official within the institution. And they served as president when the office was vacant for an extended period of time. But anyone who became provost had to have strong academic credentials, those of a faculty member. In most cases, had no formal training in management or administration, budgeting, facilities, plant operations, or the like. So as a result, provost relied on the vice president of administration and finance, the CFO, to oversee these non-academic functions. And this is pretty much the state of affairs today in research intensive universities in the United States. Meanwhile, corporations, especially those that came into existence in the 1980s and 1990s, began to make extensive use of the chief operating officer position, the COO. The CEO was the visionary and the strategic thinker who needed someone who could operationalize the vision and the strategy and make real what had been ideas, and therefore we have the COO. And that notion of the COO as the operations person who made the trains run on time, prevailed, and it still resonates in corner offices. But as Nate Bennett and Stephen Miles noted in a 2006 Harvard Business Review article, the role of the corporate COO began to take on other dimensions and led them to offer a classification of several COO roles, including executor, change agent, mentor, and others, all of which make the post of COO, and I'm going to use their quote, their words, extraordinarily situational. Now that's the corporate world, but the COO position has attraction for higher education for two particular reasons. First, the sheer size and complexity of research intensive universities, particularly those with medical schools and health system relationships, make it very difficult for a president to both represent the institution externally to governments, alumni, and donors, while at the same time administering the internal operations of the university. Now second, as smart as provosts are, the expertise they typically bring to the post of second in command does not stretch to the sort of specialized operations that now are required at a large university. At the same time, it's difficult to imagine a research intensive university hiring someone as provost who possesses specialized knowledge about all of those important operational considerations, but has never been up for tenure and promotion, never published in peer reviewed journals, never won an R01 National Institutes of Health grant. For these reasons, we thought it important to explore the COO role in higher education. And that's why we have our guest today, who was a very successful one at a major university. Jacqueline A. Travisano is the Executive Vice President for Business and Finance and Chief Operating Officer of the University of Miami, nationally ranked by U.S. News and World Report among the top private research universities in the country. She serves as the Executive Officer directly responsible for providing operational, financial, entrepreneurial, and environmental services to enhance the academic, clinical, and research experience of faculty, students, staff, patients, and the local community. Just a partial list, finance, technology, human resources, facilities operations and planning, risk management, internal audit, compliance, campus police, auxiliary operations, supply chain, budget and planning, all are within her scope of responsibility. Dr. Travisano earned her undergraduate degree from Robert Morris University, an MBA from Chatham University, and her doctorate from Nova Southeastern University. She began her professional career with Coopers and Librand nearly three decades ago, and since that time has held increasingly responsible roles in the higher education sector. A sampling includes serving as Vice President for Business Affairs, 
and CFO at St. John's University, Executive Vice President and COO of Nova Southeastern University, and in 2017, she joined the University of Miami. Welcome, Dr. Travisano, to Innovators. Thank you, Richard. I'd like to begin by returning to that article by Bennett and Miles for a moment. Those roles that they listed are not mutually exclusive, so I don't want you to feel limited to one and only one role. But in your first stint as a COO at Nova Southeastern, how would you categorize your role using the types in the article? What was the agenda you were given by the president? My role as CEO of both Nova Southeastern and the University of Miami is, is one of uh, both executor and change agent. Mm -hmm. I'm focused on the day-to-day -day operational details mm -hmm. while leading the president's strategic initiatives. At NSU specifically, I collaborated with academic leaders there to significantly raise undergraduate admission standards mm -hmm. to improve student retention and all the while uh, improving facilities. Specifically, the largest project I worked on there was the construction of a cutting edge research facility. Um, all of those things led to increased undergraduate retention and it actually propelled NSU to its first ever national ranking by U.S. News and World Report. Congratulations. At the university, oh, thank you so much. It was it was so much fun. At the University of Miami, I was brought brought in and asked to lead the foundational efforts of our strategic plan, which mm -hmm. we've called the roadmap to our new century. Right. Because uh, the University of Miami will be 100 years old in 2025, and the roadmap includes three pillars of administrative excellence that I am accountable for. Mm -hmm. The first pillar is financial sustainability. Mm -hmm. The second is operational efficiency. And the third is establishing a culture of belonging. And so far in um, two and a half years, the results are very positive. We've had two years Great. of record financial performance uh, on the technology side. We've transformed administrative computing. We've migrated all of our systems to, to Workday, which is a state-of-the-art mm -hmm. cloud-based ERP. Right. We've trained thousands of employees in training programs over the last over the last two years. We want people to feel like they, they, they belong at the university, mm -hmm. they add mm -hmm. value, and they are valued. Just out of curiosity, in both cases, you inherited something. You, 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 there was a plan in place and to some extent. How much leeway do you felt you had as COO to implement those, those plans? Well, ac actually, um, I, I don't mean to disagree, but oh, in both cases, in both cases, when I assumed the role at CEO of Nova Southeastern, mm -hmm. uh, George Hanbury had just become president. He was appointed oh, yes. president. He had formerly been the COO, so he was basically mm -hmm. replacing himself. Oh. Uh, and that's where I was hired. He had a wonderful vision for increasing uh, you know, academic quality and, mm -hmm. and uh, reputation at NSU. Mm -hmm. So it was really myself, the provost, the president, VP of Student Affairs and others working on, on what that what that could mean and what the end goal uh, was. So the plan at NSU, I had a very large role in, in developing I see. In developing the plan. Yeah. So there was a broad sense of where the university wanted to go, but you were in effect charged with along with your colleagues at the executive level with operationalizing what that plan needed to be. Not only operationalizing it, but what, what does it mean? What mm -hmm. are the metrics of success uh, going to look like? Mm -hmm. And then how are we going to put the uh, day-to-day -day operations of it into place so that it would be successful? Just out of curiosity, did you start as a consultant? Did that help you? Because one of the things that strikes me about the consulting world is you have to be an extraordinary listener, not only because you need to hear, but you need to understand. Do you think that role with Cooper's and Library, did that help you in this job, these two jobs? Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, I always say my time at Cooper's and Library was like finishing school for <laughs> <laughs> it was It was a wonderful learning experience. It was just terrific. You got exposure Ooh. to people at all levels. And yes, you know, you had clients, so you had to listen. Um, and you had to really, you know, as an auditor, so you really had to, you know, to take special care in that role. But I think for the role of the COO, all of those soft skills mm -hmm. are so important. You know, the technical skills, um, you know, in my case, you know, I've come up through the ranks in higher education. So I've, right. I've learned a lot of, of technical skills, <laughs> but it's the soft skills, you know, that really have helped me to, to get a lot of things done. 
and not break. I, I, I like to say that I get a lot done and I don't break a lot of eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Most, that's no small feat in a university. No, no small, small feat. You know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the University of Miami, too, sure, because please. I was recruited to the University of Miami um, shortly after Julio Frank became mm-hmm. president. So mm-hmm. it's twice now that I've been recruited as the COO for presidents that were you know, relatively new in their roles. Mm-hmm. And I came at Miami at the same time as the provost. So he and I were both new to the university with mm-hmm. a relatively new president. So mm-hmm. again, that was just, it was so much fun um, just really working together to shape the president's vision into something that we could actually, you know, have metrics for and, and kind of mm-hmm. know, you know what it would look like if, if we were successful. And that's the roadmap to our new century. That's our strategic plan. So in both at both Nova Southeastern and the University of Miami, mm-hmm. you know, I had a, a very large part in shaping the strategy and the metrics and now getting to to implement that vision. So it's been it's been a lot of fun. It sounds like and I guess that I, I'm struck by the fact that in both instances, as you say, the, the, the circumstances were quite similar. So I'm sure you learned something from the first time around that you brought to Miami. And I'd just be curious to know, in both those cases, were those soft skills that we, you referenced, did you possess those in full by, by the time you got there, especially this collaborative notion of yours? Was that something that you brought to it just from long years of experience? Or was that something you felt was absolutely essential because of the, the specific circumstances of the institutions? It is the soft skills are an accumulation of nearly three decades of experience in higher education. You know, mm-hmm. I think if you would talk to people who worked with me earlier in my career, <laughs> they would remember a very different person. You learn how to how to get things accomplished. And mm-hmm. being collaborative in higher education, is it's even more important as you rise through the ranks. It's always yes. important. But I think it's even more important because you're not going to be able to get anything done if people don't want to work with you. Yes. Let me turn to a little slightly different question. Michael Hoyle, he's the Vice President for Administration and Finance at LaSalle College in Massachusetts. And he wrote just recently, whether formally recognized or not as such by their institutions, college and university CFOs increasingly need to function as chief operating officers, in addition to their more traditional fiscally focused responsibilities. That's a quote. The case he makes to sustain that assertion is pretty straightforward. In order to carry out the responsibility in finance administration, the CFO really doesn't have an alternative but to think 10, 20, and 30 years out in time. And almost by default, a CFO must think and plan strategically far beyond her likely in your case, tenure. Moreover, other than the president, I suspect this is the case, the CFO is likely to be the only university executive to also be a member of the governing board. And that affords the CFO the perspective of someone charged with administering the here and now. But that dual membership also means that long-term fiduciary role at the heart of board governance is one that the CFO shares. Now, is this a strong case in your mind to CFOs becoming chief operating officers, particularly at independent colleges and universities that do not receive direct state support? Yeah, I noticed um, in that same article, Hoyle wrote that CFOs are no longer just spreadsheet gurus. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. You know, really, to be effective as a CFO, you're involved in almost every facet of the university. Mm -hmm. And I can only speak from my own experiences, but for a university to run effectively and efficiently, clear distinctions uh, for the role of the CFO and the COO need to be in place. And they both Mm -hmm. need to be thinking 10, 20, 30 years out. I mean, we we lead recommendations on on debt and financing and all of these things are just, Mm -hmm. you know, they're just going to be around long long after we are and quite frankly the university should be around of course much mm-hmm. longer than than we are so as coo i mean i've worked very closely with both the health system and our university cfos to pave the way for our president's vision mm-hmm. you know we work together to assess how the university will fund the implementation of that vision and then i work with the provost and the evp for health affairs and our deans to implement it but every institution is unique 
and having a dual CFO, COO role may work for specific universities. Oh. And, and I think it's also important to note that Mr. Hoyle was speaking from the perspective of a small private small. college. Correct. Now a university. I mean, mm -hmm. they have a little over 2,000 students. Mm -hmm. And I can see a strong case for the dual CFO, COO role at a small university mm -hmm. um, because I, because you know, quite frankly, I, I know in my own experience, I, I was not called the COO, but certainly uh, had acquired a lot of the skills exactly. um, that I have now along the way mm -hmm. when I was a CFO at a small private uh, university. But, you know, we're at these small private universities where resources and funding are limited mm -hmm. and where the level of complexity is vastly different from that of a larger private research university mm -hmm. with a vast academic medical center. I mean, I know my CFO wouldn't have the bandwidth to be the COO as well. Wow. It's just too big. It's just and, too and, big. And, and then the, the health thing in particular seems to me to, to sort of bring on a, a level of complexity that would never be expected at a small private college. Absolutely. And then they also talk about the risk, you know, of supplanting the oh, academic yes. mission and the mm -hmm. likelihood of incurring, you know, rancor from faculty and other senior administrators. Shocking, and naturally, shocking. Yeah, <laughs> but naturally there's going to be resistance toward recalibration of an academic <laughs> program, and it and it seems that uh, you know it's most difficult to overcome when you're providing data 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 driven decisions, and you got to balance, you know, weighing the academic and financial values. But you know, really to ma maintain competitive in today's market, it's a must. Faculty, uh, uh, just as students are trained in being critical thinkers, and God knows they know how to criticize. So uh, it does strike me that in a, in a small institution, the, the notion of the CFO being really the ineffective CEO does ha have a certain logic to it. And as right. you said, the COO versus the CEO, separating those two at a large complex research university also makes a great deal of sense simply because of the complexity of there. But right. that leads me to ask about public universities. Let, let, let me ask a few words about public CFOs. I think you've been in you've been in higher education long enough to remember that in the heydays, if you were a public institution, uh, you could simply be assured that whenever the enrollment went up, and the enrollment was always going to go up because it always has, you could expect that the state would never, in a timely fashion, and never enough. But nevertheless, they would send you the money you needed every year to pay the light bills and the like. But that stopped somewhere in the 1980s, I think. In effect, in many instances, uh, and I can remember at Penn State, they used to make the case, we're a state-located institution, not a state-supported institution. Because in many cases, uh, states have simply made the determination that they are not going to fund higher education as they have in the past regardless of enrollment increases. And therefore, the CFO becomes more like a private. So aren't they in the same boat? Isn't the CFO of, of a public institution pretty much in the same boat? Or is that stretching things a little too far to sort of suggest that private and public really have some of the same operating considerations? Yeah. You know, I remember being at an at a annual Nakubo meeting in, a, I think it was mm -hmm. 2000. And, um, you know, it was, you looked around the room and the CFOs and the publics, you know, were, used to be always so happy. <laughs> and they were a lot less happy as they were trying to figure out, you know, what's coming next, you know, yes. performance-based funding, you yep. know, cuts in, in, yep. in enrollment. And it yep. just was, it was awful. But really, you know, I believe that whether it, you're going to have a, a dual CFO or COO mm -hmm. role, it just mm -hmm. really depends on the size and the resources of the institution. Got it. So if, regardless if it's a private or a public mm -hmm. college or mm -hmm. university, if you want stronger financial sustainability, you know, perhaps expanding the role of the CFO to include mm -hmm. operations could, you know, positively impact the bottom line. But the, but the real key is just to successfully align the financial goals with the strategic priorities and avoid having the achievement of one objective occur at the expense of another. <laughs> Everything else. And both, you know, and really, whether you're, whether you're um, a CFO or a COO in a public or a private university, you need to be focused on finding alternative sources of revenue. Mm -hmm. Because an institution just anymore cannot survive on mm -hmm. tuition or, and or state funding alone. 
we, we got to be constantly looking at efficiencies. We got to be constantly looking at maximizing our resources. And we got to be, you know, constantly looking at investments for, you know, not only a mission return, mm -hmm. but a financial return. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. It's, Somebody it's, has to pay the light bill in the end. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, I was just going to say, the more I think about the work you, the job you do now, I try to imagine what keeps you awake at night now that you really, I mean, you may have considered it and may have thought about it a little bit, but five years ago, it really wasn't on your radar. It's not the thing that was right in your face that, that needed to be dealt with. What is it yeah. now that keeps you awake at night? I don't know that it necessarily keeps me awake at night, but it's something we think about a lot uh, here at the University of Miami, and that would be hurricanes. As the massive storm systems that develop in the Atlantic, yes. you know, I watch the Weather Channel so much, I'm practically a meteorologist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the, these massive storms that we've, we've been having, you know, they're worrisome. They're really worrisome. And, you know, we have, you know, over 4,000 students here on campus that we are responsible for, 16,000 students in total, another 16,000 employees, and, and hundreds of thousands of patients and, you know, people that we are caring for in our health system. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the massive storms, they are enough to to keep you up at night, but we are really a storm-ready campus, mm -hmm. and our team has um, storm readiness down to nearly a science, and I think that was evident when Hurricane Dorian was approaching yes. South Florida. Yes. It was also evident with Hurricane Irma in 2017. You know, after every one of these situations, we, we make adjustments to our plan. So um, even well before we're in the cone of uncertainty, right. you know, our team, our team is, is in action. So the natural other things are, of course, a concern, violence, all these other yes. things, um, you know, mental health, all these things that we worry about as, as an institution, but you know, hurricanes are pretty unique to the University of Miami or anybody you know in this you know coastal community. And I was just thinking, I agree with you completely. Anybody who lives in a storm area such as yours is, is clearly going to have to be dealing with with a whole range of issues associated with weather. But I am struck also by I don't know if I would have expected a time when universities would have to worry about raging fires. Uh, I don't know that I would have thought exactly. uh, about some of the, the natural, quote, hazards, unquote, that now seem to play just about everywhere. I mean, whether you're in North Dakota or Iowa or Oklahoma, it, it, it seems as though the, the climate change, to some extent, has become a, a constant, and it doesn't seem to differentiate, although I would be the first to agree that you in Miami sort of sticks out into that area of the Atlantic and the Caribbean, where you're, yeah. you're definitely a target. But of course, that yeah. leads me to ask, you have a crystal ball, I'm sure. I, when I talk to your staff, they say that Jackie has a great crystal ball. So the crystal ball, what is it that you're looking out five, six, seven years now? What are the issues on the horizon that may keep you up watching a little, lot of late night TV? <laughs> You know, I, I like to say that I can see around corners, but really I can't. Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, I, th I think a lot I think a lot about the future. You know, I tell everybody, you know, the present will resolve itself. The, the future, you know, we got to be thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in particular, as I look at this freshman class coming next fall, right. you know, they're a generation that's born post 9-11. And it's really hard to believe that, you know, such a poignant, life-changing, historical mm -hmm. event is just something that they're going to read about. You know, they they don't know what life was like before mm -hmm. September 11th. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know they don't know what it's like to have, you know, a world where we didn't have, you know, heightened concerns about safety, mm -hmm. vigilance, and, and data mm -hmm. privacy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really wonder what this whole um, constant access to information, constant communication, Google society mm -hmm. is going to have on our future. And I think about it a lot. I know, mm -hmm. you know, we think about the pedagogy of teaching these yes. students, yes. The, the impact of, of their living experience here on campus, you know, how that should evolve. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, you know, I wonder how that's going to, to play out, you know, in my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wistful tone in your voice just then. I, no, no, you can't yeah. retire. You can't retire. <laughs> yeah. But it is 
to what you say that we've lived in a we live in a world that's so radically different from say mm-hmm. that that I grew up in where information was scarce and mm-hmm. you had to it was difficult to get hold of. Now information's not the not the problem. It's how to deal with a flood of information, especially when you're living in a time where the example I always think of most recently is that when we have one of these violent acts take place, and within minutes there's someone with their phone who's video who's actually videoed the, pro, the, the action and you see it immediately. I, right. I don't know what that does to help us to understand. The, the Buckminster Fuller way back in the 1950s had a phrase, a word he, I think he developed called ephemeralization. And he, he argued that, that things change so rapidly sometimes it's almost impossible at time to say that's a fact, that's reality because it changes so quickly. So your world, I think I, I hear you suggesting it's even more difficult now to speculate about the future because it could be so radically different from what we know now. Um, right. We need to make sure we're evolving. That's for sure. Well, it sounds to me like that, that, that is something that you, you guys uh, are going to, especially where you are, you're going to have a great deal to think about. Mm-hmm. Now I, I want to pick on you just a little bit because you are a rarity to some extent. Uh, there are not many women who hold your position among research universities. There are some, but not many. And just about every college and university I know has a diversity inclusion plan, which lays out the institution's commitment to hiring and serving a a diverse population. Recent numbers show that notwithstanding all that effort, we've got a long way to go to achieve diversity in higher education, especially especially in our leadership positions. For you, what price do universities and colleges pay when diversity in general is not achieved, but women more specifically are not fully represented in leadership roles? You are the exception. I don't know. It's, it's staggering when you look at the disparity of women in leadership roles in higher mm-hmm. education. Mm-hmm. You know, women are only, what, one-third of leadership, um, and, about, it's, and it's not really... The needle has not really moved. No, it has since not. Since 2010. Moved. Absolutely. So, and and uh, you know we keep we keep graduating more and more women. We see mm-hmm. more and more women um, coming to college, and the you know even the percentage of women as college presidents, although it's slowly crept up <laughs> over the last 30 years, but it's still you know, 30 percent. And around, it's still small, right? So I just think that there's just this unconscious bias that prevails when women are considered mm-hmm. for the top spot. And the first mm-hmm. step in overcoming uh, this bias is just possible when both men and women shoulder the responsibility for increasing the diversity in their institutions. You know, I've been very, very, very lucky to work uh, in the last decade for you know, President George Hanbury and President Julia Frank. I mean, they've just, they're just outstanding leaders who, who really believe in, uh, you know, they walk walk the talk as far as diversity and listening to various, you know, stakeholders. You know, at UM, uh, President Frank, you know, he set a strategic institution-wide objective and he's committed to programs. We have one um, called LEAD that we just Mm -hmm. rolled out, Learn, Achieve, Empower, and Develop. Mm -hmm. It's for leaders across all administrative and academic functions. And 63% of our current LEAD participants are female leaders. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And in our other leadership programs that we have at the UIC, and I told you there's just we're training thousands, you know, we have nearly 70% of female leaders going through those trainings. So, you know, it's really investing in, mm-hmm. it's, it's walking the talk, it's investing in their development. So, I mean, what price do they pay? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert on, on you know, a specific uh, price that a university would mm-hmm. pay. But I will say that I think there's a lot of advantages, of course, to having diverse mm-hmm. opinions. Mm-hmm. I think you just get a better outcome. It's interesting that that's, you know, the, we now have data that suggests that diversity that really does provide you with a better decision-making process. Your decisions may still not work out completely, but in terms of the process, we know that having a diverse environment really does make that happen. We yeah. like to ask our guests to leave something behind for our listeners to take away you have one for us? Oh, gosh. You know, thanks. I, if I was giving any advice, you know, again, I would just want people to know that, you know, you really 
can continue to invest in your technical skills, but also invest in your soft skills. They will help you to be successful. And then I guess I'd also say that, you know, in this role as the COO, or even when I was a CFO, Mm -hmm. you know, perhaps the most fun and effective that you're going to be is when your relationship with your provost, your academic partners, your deans Mm -hmm. is is strong and solid and everyone is fully aligned. And sometimes that means being flexible. They do think differently <laughs> and that's okay. And, and you have to be able to, to be flexible and be, be understanding and, and help everyone win. If you can do that, you're, you're going to be just great. I'd also probably say, um, you know, to just to keep, keep thinking about the future. It's, mm. it's a lot more fun than standing still in the present. I can see why you're good at your job. Oh, thank, thank you, you. very, very you, much Richard. for your time. I, I hope that we have another opportunity to talk maybe in the next few years. It'll be fun to come back and visit you. I suspect there'll be a lot of change that have taken place. And I suspect that the perspective you have will be one that is going to be increasingly essential for getting us through these next few I won't say perilous, but these will not be dull years ahead of us, I don't think. On behalf of all of us at Harris Search Associates, I thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for the opportunity. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow. 